and welcome to Chatty AF, the Anime Feminist Podcast. My name's Amelia, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Anime Feminist, and I'm joined here today by Rai Kaiser and very special guest, Miranda Sanchez from IGN. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Rai, I'm the Editor... I'm an editor and contributor at Anime Feminist. Uh, I do work a lot across the internet, so you can find most of it at uh, on Twitter at Writer Vry, or the other podcast I co-host at Trash Pod. And hello, I'm Rena Sanchez. I am an editor at IGN, and I am kind of in charge of a lot of our anime work now. Now I have a good old anime budget, so if you've got any anime pitches, please send them to me, because I would love to pay you to write for us. Uh, so... <laughs> That's about it, yeah. And uh, Kill Kill is one of my favorite anime of all time, so I've been very excited to be on the show to kind of hear about what people do and don't like about Kill Kill and kind of get a very critical look at it that I haven't got to do before. Miranda's been a trooper. Absolutely. <laughs> it's been a really interesting journey, this one. So for, for the uninitiated, you probably want to go back a few episodes, but we're doing a watch along, which is where we take six episodes of an anime series at a time and we we watch them and then we get together a group of one person who has seen the whole series and loves it and ideally two people who have never seen this show and are watching it for the first time and then we have a discussion where we review it from a feminist perspective with no idea of what's to come so this is the first week where we can really talk about the entire series of kill the kill and put it into more fandom context which i'm really excited to do because i think that's part of the that's part of the big interest around Kill the Kill is the fact that it polarizes such strong opinions. And I think it really has quite a special place in fandom for that. Um, Vry, how did you find these six episodes compared to the previous six or compared to the previous rest of the series? Let's focus on the six episodes for now and then we'll move into the whole season discussion. I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, I think this is certainly the st- a stretch, the stretch of episodes that I both had the most consistently good time watching like all the way through yeah it, it still it still did that yo-yo thing to me that i discussed last week where where something really neat would happen and then it would slap me in the face and remind me that i was watching kill the kill mm-hmm. uh i i think the uh like for example you know i would be like oh gosh i'm really really into satsuki's arc oh Oh wait, no wait. Here is a uh, here is yet more molestation. This is cool and great. Yep. You haven't earned this. And then I would be like, "Wow, Ryuko's a uh, voice actress is having such a really great time being evil Ryuko." Oh, we're showing that she's evil and brainwashed by having her Mac on Nui. That's great. Cool. Good job, show. Awesome. <laughs> like it was a roller coaster. I think I on Twitter I described this stretch as and, and like the back half as a whole as being about evenly divided with between things I thought were really cool and impressive and things that really pissed me off. I think that really sums up Kill the Kill though. And I mean, these, I, I agree with you. I had the best time these six episodes, but I still I still struggled with it. I'm sorry, this show was just never for me. Um, but I did find one thing that really helped for me was that there was a bit more, it felt like there was a bit more of an equal distribution of ridiculous nakedness. Mm-hmm. That was just, it was such a small thing. But the fact is those those early episodes where it's just Duco being humiliated, like stripped naked. And well, not just Duco, actually. I think even in the first six, there are other people who get stripped naked and humiliated and it's just unpleasant to watch. Whereas in these final six episodes, nudity's just become such a <laughs> an essential thing for the story that so many of them, they're just getting naked all the time. And the guys, especially the guys in the Elite Four, their costumes get a bit ridiculous and I thoroughly appreciated that more even distribution but I still hate the yeah it it took a while to get there for sure too and like a lot of people point to that it's like well they get just as equally naked it's like yeah but not until the very very end end. (laughs) very end yeah and you can't call that equal treatment Mm -hmm. no but by the time they did get there it did feel equally ridiculous like you've got the nudist beach guys who are stood there with just like tool belts <laughs> like instead of clothing tool belts and boots and like pink purple glows over their nipples I was like okay this is this is pretty ridiculous and you've got Gamagori and uh, I can't remember their names like that's unfortunately is it Inumuta um, yeah they've got these kind mm-hmm. of selectively revealing costumes Inumuta's co- final costume was really cute <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, like some aesthetic but it reminded- there but that's the thing is it reminded me of the kind of 
fan service costumes that you have on women and I sort of appreciated seeing that mirrored actually and had they introduced that element early on like really early on it would have given to my mind more credence to the suggestion that this is parody whereas it did not feel like parody for a good chunk of the season well and I like the way that so. Nonon is drawn in this stretch too because her that was interesting mm-hmm. wasn't it because it went a lot more adult well but but her nudity is very is is very nonchalant like her breasts aren't draw- yes. emphasized or even drawn in a lot of the shots she's in and yes. so her like on the flip side to the other the, the male members of the elite four having more revealing uh sexual costumes she is also drawn with less emphasis on the sexualized assets so like i was cool with the way that they like the elite four has always been the best part of the show but i was yeah. i was cool with their whole thing over there this run yeah i i go with that i mean i didn't i didn't love her <laughs> i didn't love her final costume but again no. it was it was no. in context with the rest of the elite four having more ridiculous costumes it didn't feel any worse than anything else I'd seen in Kill the yeah. Kill. I, I guess so, I was talking like, more about when she was wearing the bandoliers and nothing else. And that was and that was totally fine with me actually because that's what everyone in Nudist Beach wears. Mm-hmm. And as you said, like the way that she's drawn and the way that she's animated, actually this is goes across the board is that a lot of the time they're wearing these these awkward clothes, but they're not necessarily framed to titillate. Not necessarily. There are times when absolutely that is the point. Ryuko's panty are shots are back. Right. Oh, that stood out so badly because they haven't done it for a while. Yeah, that was bad. But but I do want to say this because I, I, I've really struggled with Kill the Kill and there are a few positive things I can say about it. And so I want to make sure that I do. <laughs> get I it can. out, get it out. So when they're fighting, it is so unglamorous. And th- there have been moments in previous episodes in the series where the fighting has still been really fan servicey, and I just didn't get that so much this this stretch of six episodes. And it got to a point where I became super blasé about the nudity because the fact was that they were still in combat, and that was the main thing. Mm-hmm. So that I did really appreciate, but I just wish they'd done that sooner, like from the beginning. That would have helped so much with my experience of this show. Yeah, I think I think this is a problem that a lot of anime has where two core shows finally feel like they can shake off the status quo and do the really interesting thing in the last six episodes of the second core. Oh. Like um last last recording I mentioned Gundam Double O, a series that isn't good that I like and that was definitely only one season long, where its last six episodes were also <laughs> really interesting and finally shook off a lot of <laughs> what was stiff and unpleasant about that series. But it wasn't worth having to wait that long and that's that's the unfortunate thing is that i actually i would have stopped watching i think i recorded this in the first podcast i I can't remember what which episode it was but roughly episode three there was a point where i was like nope this has crossed my deal breaker threshold and i would not watch as a viewer i mean to be honest episode one probably would have fit into that but episode three would have been my definite switch off moment And now, having seen the entire series, I kind of feel like that would have been the right call for me. I really haven't got a lot out of this one, I think, as a viewer. Mm -hmm. As a critic, actually seeing it has been really helpful, I think. And a lot of people will continue to ask me, I'm sure, what do you think of Kill a Kill? Is Kill a Kill feminist? And I finally have some answers. I mean, they're not answers that are going to be particularly popular. (laughs) but they are answers and I do feel like I can back them up. And there are still things that I like. Like There was one moment in the very final, like 10 minutes or something, where you've got Satsuki and Ragyo and uh, Ryuko, and then you've got the Elite Four fighting, including Nonon. And I was like, this is so full of like, I got strong female characters, oh no. But like, (laughs) it's full of women who are fighting and who are capable of fighting and, some of them have special powers and some of them don't and it it was just it was such a good mix i was like and from some particular angles this could be considered diversity but it's just undermined by these other things that i don't like so i I appreciate being able to get to a point where i can talk about these things now at the very least and yeah these last six episodes i'm really glad they did save the best for last because now i have a much more positive view of it than i did i think certainly in the, the second set of six episodes there is a lot of good stuff in these last six episodes. Like the the nudity is finally doing something smart. I think it's 
it really kind of bums me out that the good stuff that's doing here, I feel like the show undermines itself. Yeah, the... especially yeah early on, like they just just the way they framed everything beforehand makes I think this fun part a little bit lesser because of how they treated it previously. And it's like if they would have just carried that lightheartedness about nudity, I think throughout the show, then it could have ultimately been a lot better. Just yeah, in... I, that's it. Like I don't think I've ever run across more than like a handful of anime where I where I like desperately wish that it had been remade because mostly anime just is what it is and if nothing else it's an interesting time capsule but god do I want someone to remake Kill a Kill with a female writer and director we will come back to that later on <laughs> for the moment though there was so much that I liked in these last six episodes like I continued to like all the characters that I liked and then they were surrounded by some really good emotional beats and Mako was the best girlfriend on earth and there were some really fun creative fight scenes and the nudity was finally done in like a smart way and I love shaking the status quo like apocalyptic world shifts like that's that's the fun part of anime for me and also there was aliens and more really good body horror. <laughs> and it was gay. <laughs> they went on a Let's date. Let's talk about that. They went they, on a date. Right. They did it. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, it's, let's dive into that. Because I saw Vry, you got some pushback on that. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Oh, really? I don't hate Kill the Kill fans. I hate the Kill the Kill fandom and I'm going to fight every last one of them. <laughs> it's, I think, it, it, I mean, it got to a point when, when Mako was saying, let's go on a date and it's like okay that it isn't necessarily romantic in Japanese culture like the phrasing let's go on a date but you look at the context like she goes down on one knee asks Nuka for a date and then shows images of the two of them kissing I, I don't know what you have to do to be more explicit here yeah it's, it's very clear it, what's going it's on very there. clear it's like it's very clear and like kill a kill fandom doesn't even have the shitty thing that samurai flamenco fandom had to deal with where that series ends with a marriage proposal but then the shitlord creators no homo it I, i'm <laughs> bitter at them forever yay death of the author Th that that's not even <laughs> <laughs> so have the have the creators commented on duko and mako i I mean, I have heard things. I don't have sources because these are always con stories, and you know how those right. are. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've heard them give the the, sta the industry standard, we can't comment on that, which is basically as close to a yes as you're ever going to get. I've heard, I, and again, I don't want to spread rumors, so somebody please source this for me, but I have heard that they've said, we can't comment, but no Mako is not with Gamagori. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I wish I could remember where I saw that. And do take this with a pinch of salt and try and research it for me, listeners. Um, but that that is something that I heard. Either way, they've definitely not denied it. They've definitely not no homo it. Yeah, That's well, and, and for sure. There was an interview not long after the show ended where the director talked about, like, Ryuko and Senketsu's relationship being the most important one, which strikes me as one of those things, well, fucking duh. But also it doesn't <laughs> contradict the ability... The, the other the other good and canonical ship. The thing is, I mentioned in the first episode that my experience with Kill a Kill back in the day was people coming to me being excited about Ryumako and me kind of wanting to support them and then maybe saying things I wasn't that that I knew only from skimming the show. So naturally, Kill a Kill fans decided to come knock on my doorstep and be mm. like, "Listen, it's not homophobic to say they're just good friends, okay?" So, and it made me really bitter about the fandom. So, allow me to say, now that I've watched 24 episodes of Kill la Kill, Kill la Kill fandom, <laughs> Ryuko and Mako's relationship is one of the central tenets of the show that's done really well. And they're in a relationship by the end. And if you can't admit that, you're a fucking coward. Hell yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I also want to add that I have nothing against Mako and Gamagori as a ship. I get why people ship that. It's very cute. And Mako <laughs> is clearly very, very bisexual and would be very poly. You can ship yeah, I think them that's, both. That's the thing, too, is like people ignore that that's a possibility. It's like, hey, what if she's bisexual? What if they could what? be poly? What if she can love more than one more than one person? And like obviously what? Gamagori has a thing for her. Like at the end during the date, he has like these flowers. He's like really shy, and it's like no, she's on another date. Stop! You can't Stop go it. there right she's now. Busy. It is not your day. Scheduling yeah. is important. Although Satsuki ends up on that date, right? Well, that's, that's because Big Sister has to chaperone her little sister's first date. Uh. Yes, but interesting. It, it, it does genuinely upset me that. 
today, today, the day of recording, on this, the day of my daughter's wedding, <laughs> somebody, somebody was on my timeline, like, what? But, but Mako is so clearly with, you know, the big guy. And I'm like, but no, he has a crush on her. And Mako is sad when she thinks she, he's died because she has the capacity for human empathy. That's not, they ended up together. I don't, they, that just drives me crazy. They go on a date at the end. Mako and Ryuko <laughs> are on a date at the end of this this entire series. That's the capstone. That's it. They're dating. It, yeah. <laughs> what? It, the, 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 the goalposts get moved so far, and people are so willing to bend over backwards to see why something is actually just platonic. And mm. meanwhile, if a man expresses emotions at a woman... Obviously, that means they are together and a canonical couple. <laughs> and it really, really upsets me because because something like this with queer relationships happening in a genre show is like the big goal that a lot of people want. But this is the shit that happens when it tries to, when, when it starts getting introduced. Oh, gosh, those good gal pals. <laughs> it makes me yeah, so I bad. actually didn't. I actually didn't realize there was any queer representation in Kill the Kill mm -hmm. before watching it. I had no idea because that just was not part of the discussion around it. And now I'm amazed because it's the most, I think it's the most canon representation I've seen outside like sp explicitly queer texts. It's kind of on the Yuri on Ice level, right? Yeah. Where it's- Yeah, yeah it is. It, yeah. it does make me pleased that Wikipedia lists Kill a Kill as series, as one of the series containing Yuri content that is not classified oh, as Yuri genre. That's good, because it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Once we got to that final stretch, that final monologue from Mako, like it just gets to a point where it's like, okay, you, you actually can't deny this without cutting out a chunk of what is physically on screen. And, well, and the, the scene on the boat where Mako's, where Mako wants to defend the place where Ryuko feels safe, and I had a lot of emotions. Oh. And that's a thematic pillar of the series, right? Is this idea that Mako offers that kind of stability and safety to Ryuko. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and Ryuko talks about that... the important people in her life as being Senketsu and Mako, and yeah. also some other and people. I, thought... I did think it was quite nice when they drew the parallels at the end between Ryuko and the weird people surrounding her, <laughs> and Satsuki and the weird people surrounding her, and they seem to kind of draw a parallel as well between the cups of tea that Satsuki has that we find out have, have been like really bitter her entire life and she's just never commented before and then on Mako's side you've got these um, croquettes filled with goodness knows what and they're just like really happy eating those regardless of the unidentified ingredients and they just they drew that parallel between them and set them up as in in such a way that the sisterly thing felt a bit more natural mm -hmm. actually it didn't feel shoehorned in almost i really liked that like i i do i like that kind of awkward that that kind of awkward moment where they're trying to figure that out at the end <laughs> yes. it's it's very good yeah really adorable and yuko and satsuki in general like i've always enjoyed them together on screen and i really appreciate the arc that both of them have been given to become closer and that ending where Satsuki's on the date with Yuko and Mako, I just thought was utterly adorable. Oh, good chaperone. Good yeah, chaperone. Satsuki's arc in general may be the best written part of the series. Like this this idea of being... I, I really like that idea for a character arc of, of the the older child who is molded and forced into being becoming like what her parent wants her to be, only to be tossed away because her younger sibling is the special chosen one mm -hmm. like yeah. she's the, the vegeta but she's also un... more than that and she's the underachiever which like just switching that framing around in these last six episodes that was incredible like it felt really good as a viewer adding this new dimension to Satsuki's character that we hadn't really seen before she was the disappointment all along like that's that's incredible to me. Yeah, Satsuki's arc is really good. Although I will say, I would like to place a moratorium on male writers writing about fraught mother-daughter relationships. Uh, yeah, this was a bit of a... Because... That moment when she's kind of spanking Satsuki's naked butt. Okay, that, that was... was some horseshit. But what I meant more generally was, like, I'm very tired <laughs> okay. of, of men writing about how daughters are just so 
like suffocated by their mothers and meanwhile they had a great relationship with their father who never contributed anything negative to their upbringing um, it's like ground zero of women be competing like your mother yeah. suffocated you and you had a great time with your dad and men understand you i yeah, don't care sense. for that and i so like yes often mothers and daughters do have complex or negative relationships but maybe women should write those yeah it's like you're using like these blanket statements about how how they have been negatively impacted by their mothers and it's the same things over and over and over and it's not anything that feels genuine or unique yeah and so it's just like oh dad did nothing wrong Mm -hmm. he was he was the hero of the story dad was great god we miss dad (laughs) <laughs> what did you think of what did you think of Lagio's character in the end? I mean, she's terrible, but also she's kind of fun to watch. That 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 good good body horror. I I am absolutely in the process of brainstorming a piece about that scene le- from the last set of episodes where they put her in Marie Antoinette hair, clearly not understanding what Marie Antoinette <laughs> oh, yeah. had to do with fashion. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that- R- Ragio is is yet another element of wow I wish this series had women at the helm because because I want to really enjoy her but I'm held back by the idea by the fact that this is men writing an evil matriarch yeah her villainy could have been done so much better I I think there Mm -hmm. are moments when she was framed well but her actions didn't always fit well I think Mm -hmm. or it's just like stereotypical as we kind of go back to that again yeah I did like it when she ripped her own heart out that was badass <laughs> i was like wow i'm so impressed like there are <laughs> things that they have for ragio that i really appreciate just like how they hold her to this is like such high esteem in her presence and like just how they give that such gravity um mm. but then it comes down to her actions and like how she is bad is where yeah, it like, becomes the problem all of the molestation shit yep yeah oh. so don't ever need that to happen ever again and, ever. and it, it please yeah why (laughs) like the it bums me out because like i i kind of like that whole the general idea of the archetype that happens with ryuko's brainwashing uh you know i I, i'm down for that whole character archetype where you trap a character in a delusion and and Mm -hmm. then you know the 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 person important to them has to come and save them and gives me feelings but like and, and i really love that one shot of of ryuko like smiling and crying like that that's my shit but then they wrapped it around this this once again aggressive female sexuality is evil and predatory cool great good job kill a kill mm. yeah that makes sense i didn't like i i don't usually enjoy that that kind of arc but actually i'll, I'll be honest i've completely converted into a mako fan <gasps> Yay! So that's all we could ask for completely <laughs> <laughs> I saw. I I actually went back to the comments on the first episode um, on our site and saw somebody saying, "I can't wait until Amelia becomes a Mako fan <laughs> because everybody does." <laughs> and it was too late, and they were already right, and I was so annoyed. <laughs> but yeah, Mako snapping her out of that was a beautiful moment, and it, I just love the fact that Mako is that fearless. She doesn't hesitate to throw herself in harm's way if it's to protect Luko. It doesn't even occur to her that bad things could happen to her. Or if it does, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because it's worth it. I, I love that. She's very good. The best. I wanted to talk a little bit about another of the themes that they had. So Luko and Senketsu, in the end, they both describe themselves as being neither human nor clothing, but also human and clothing. <laughs> and like, I'm... They... way reading too much into this I'm sure but like as a mixed race person it kind of bothered me a bit that the eventual solution was to split them completely apart mm. that I, I don't know it felt uncomfortable so that's that's something that I don't think was ever intended and so on and so forth but just there was a moment where I was like wait the answer is to just separate their mixed attributes completely rather than letting them be and mm. It didn't sit well with me mm-hmm. at all. But did either of you kind of respond to that? At that point, they are starting to scream, nonsensical is our thing. And it's just like, yeah, you hit that <laughs> on the nose. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and so that's kind of um, where yeah. I kind of got at that point. Like, they are almost shouting things that they t- quite didn't get themselves. <laughs> yeah, and To me, that scene was just so very... The writers are in over our head, and we're not as... You're not as deep <laughs> as you think you are. Please stop. Right. 
it's not like I said I was instantly like oh my goodness pearl clutching or anything but just later on I was thinking about it I was like oh I didn't really like that story development and I couldn't it took me a little while to kind of put my finger on it but I didn't like the way that the the answer to being half of something and yet a combined new thing was to split that apart it just didn't it didn't mm. sit well with me at all no but that's like but, that's a problem and I think it is yeah. an outgrowth of what I was <laughs> sensing was that this has always been kind of a Kill a Kill likes to coast on the fact that it's dumb but flashy, and sometimes what and when it tries to say a deep thing, it usually doesn't have a very good handle on that deep thing, and usually ends up hurting people rather than helping them. But I can't even figure out what they were trying to say with that because it seemed that they were saying that when you combine the two things, it's more powerful than remaining isolated and separate. And I was like, okay, this is this is kind of standard rhetoric around these sorts of things. And then they said, no, actually, it's it's inevitable that you must be stripped apart. And that was, I, I don't really understand if, I think if there was a message there. It kind or... of went down to identity for me and not not like as you exist as a human being, but I guess as of like personality, it's like what you identify with and that like they're kind of going back to like saving fashion. I think that's what Mako said before Ryuko left. Uh, like saving girls fashion or whatever and how yeah. I guess clothing going back to like the most rud rudimentary part of clothing and identity of like helping you visibly convey who you are and like ultimately mm -hmm. that doesn't define you but it is part of you but you can still separate them I didn't kind of mm -hmm. take it from as hey we're dividing ourselves from our genetic makeup it's more of a who I I perceive myself as, but that's still separate. I don't know, nonsensical. That's a nicer reading. That's a yeah. That's <laughs> that's kind of how I took it the first time around, and kind of again this time. I didn't think about it more of like how they are, I guess, of mixed origin human slash clothing. Thing. I mean, I'm particularly sensitive to these messages. Right. And I do acknowledge that it's something that always I'm. And that's absolutely fair. Like it's it's that bothers yeah, it you. That's mean totally it's not fair valid. to talk about. Yeah. So that was, yeah, it's something that I would have liked to have seen actually explored, but I guess that's the theme for Kill the Kill for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that that was like the one time when I felt like Kill the Kill actually had a statement with Gravitas, or one of the few times was was that, you know... Nonsense is our thing? What, what, no, was, uh, was Sinketsu's last <laughs> line about, you know, every girl out outgrows her sailor uniform eventually. And just that that, makes sense. that idea of it as a capstone on Ryuko's coming of age. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I think it, uh, you know, I think everything it fucked up up to then kind of undermines that. But in isolation, <laughs> it's a nice sentiment about how all of this could have been a story about Ryuko coming to terms with how her body is perceived by others and finally how she takes agency of it for herself. Like that could have been a nice thing. If, once we get into the discourse, I think that's where a lot of the fandom's discourse for it being feminist comes in. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, that's a lot of where they point to, but we can talk about that later. We can talk about that right now. That's a perfect segue. Oh, man. Perfect then. So, yeah, when I was, <laughs> I guess, researching things, I'm like, when well, you guys said, hey, we're going to answer this question, so, like, is Kill Kill feminist? I, I was like, hmm, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> but... I wanted to see what other people were saying about it because obviously other people have said it is and so I tried to like hunt down as much of that as I could and a lot of times what I found was that Kamu the Kamui were compared to puberty um, especially with the butt offering all that good stuff those implications of like your body maturing um, and being ogled for sexual tension and discomfort that comes with it and while I could see it being read as that, and maybe that's probably what it is about, like, maturity and, you know, coming of age and outgrowing your sailor uniform. Uh, that certainly does not make it feminist. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> like, I can see the seed of how that... I can see a world where this was Utena, but it's not Utena. <laughs> um, yeah. But and, and the thing of it to me is that having an idea that could be read as feminist doesn't count if you can't execute it. Like, I mean... I, um, that reminds me of Zack Snyder's statements around Sucker Punch. Like, when he talks about Sucker Punch, he, he talks about as being like, you know, ah, oh, these, these women are escaping from this, are, are all dancing for these gross, slobbering men in the dark, and the, the audience is the men in the dark, and they're the ones slaver like slobbering over these women in costumes, and don't you feel bad? I made a feminism. 
but you still put your actresses in skimpy costumes and had them play out the fantasy, bro. Yeah, there is a line between well, the, anything that tries to satirize something or tries to parody. Like there is a fine line between actually satirizing something and just doing the thing. Mm-hmm. And when people talk about Kill the Kill as satire or as parody, like now I've seen it, I think I would disagree quite strongly with that. I don't think, to, to my mind, I don't think this is defensible as satire. It doesn't send it up anywhere near explicitly enough. Well, its best yeah. moments are when it's being sincere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and it definitely buys into all of the tropes that they're trying to uh, supposedly satire, right? And like they make use mm, of it in yeah. such a way that just feels like they're generally trying to use it not satire so and yet and yet we're gonna have comments full of well it's obviously parody you obviously just didn't get it (laughs) you can't see it but i'm staring at my monitor with dead dead eyes (laughs) (laughs) because you know it's true and that's yeah that's something that i knew was inevitable with doing a kill the kill watch along i know that we're gonna have people who step up specifically because they love this show and the idea of calling it anything but feminist is upsetting and I do understand that but I, I don't think I can come down on their their perspective on this right. I don't think I can see it from their perspective at all it's just like I love this show so much but I have so many problems with it and that's <laughs> yeah, there okay are, there are good things in this show it, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think I hold strong on my metaphor that, that Trigger has served me a diamond encased in dog shit <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and just no one and, and meanwhile a group of people are standing around me po-facedly assuring me that I must not I, I must indeed in, consume that dog shit because the diamond is worth it <laughs> that's a horrible metaphor <laughs> it's and yet it's my experience with the kill the kill fandom po-facedly insisting that I eat dog shit and not complain <laughs> Well, let's hope that we get some people commenting on the things that we've said and in taking part in the discussion with us on this one, because I think we've raised a lot of good points over the the course of this discussion. But there also equally may have been things we missed, like Miranda talked about it being as a, as a metaphor of puberty. We've not really discussed that, I think. Right. And so there's got to be there's got to be quite a lot that we've we've not talked about that fandom over the years has dug into. So it'll be good to kind of hear some of that. But I don't think that my core feeling about it will change. I don't think my impression of it as not particularly feminist. I don't think that will change. Although appreciate is you know is this feminist is we've discussed many times not a very useful question a lot of the time mm-hmm. and deciding that something is or isn't feminist actually has no impact whatsoever on somebody's personal relationship with it you can a hundred percent draw feminist messages from a text that is not necessarily particularly feminist itself so we're not commenting on people's personal experiences but as a text itself I think there's plenty of room for improvement and I would quite like to see a show that did that yes yeah, as, as a as a distinction, I think I would draw that I can see what people get out of this show if they can sit through the... I still think the whole first half is bad with a few good bits, I'm sorry, but that that mm. second half, like, I can see where people get, get to. This is messy, but it has things I really like. Um, but I don't think Trigger deserves any head pats for doing anything progressive, really. Well, except maybe Ryuko and Mako, I'll, you know. I was going to say, I think that's that's quite significant, isn't it? Yeah, they can have Ryuko and Mako, but as far as, like, the depictions of female sexuality, female bodies, female puberty, no, no head pats. And it, it depresses me that It's kind of hard to it... get those mm-hmm. right when you don't have a woman writing it, you know, maybe. Yeah, it's a... <laughs> that could be or a problem. Or, like, any significant women on staff, <laughs> as nearly as I can tell. Like, I'm sure that there are women working in the animation, because animation is huge. But but as far as like the high up writing and directing and producing this um, positions, it doesn't. I don't. I don't think so. I could be wrong, but and it it depresses me because I don't think Trigger has really grown up at all. Because uh, Darla Fron. Did you see a uh, Little Witch? No, I was no. It say, does look cute uh, and nice, but it is. I am informed that Darling in the Franks is actually more of an A one picture thing. You don't say. A thing, so. I think I heard yeah, that once or I twice. Oh, this no. is what I hear. Um, but Little Witch Academia apparently is is very good. I've not seen that yet. One of the sweetest anime I've ever seen, and I adore it so much. That's good. 
That's good. But you also like Kill the Kill. I, so I also like Kill the Kill. You can really be trusted. So. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No more trusting Miranda with anything. Oh, man. I mean, it, it does look very cute and cute and sweet and nice. Yeah, which, I, you know, I'd like to I'd like to see it at some point. Um, but I don't... I, th- I think I'm quite happy to talk about the reputation that Trigger has as a result of this show. Trigger as a whole is well beyond my expertise, well beyond my, my knowledge. I haven't seen enough of this stuff. Um, but based on Just Kill the Kill, if they get any kind of feminist credibility for this show, I don't think they should. Um, by and large, I think, maybe, yeah, maybe some for Duko and Mako. I do appreciate, as I've said, the diversity of the female characters that are involved. That's pretty much where it ends. And that's pretty much it. Oh, the... It's not It's not a particularly high bar. It's not a lieutenant levels or anything like that. So we're being pretty damning about a pretty popular studio <laughs> now. So. I mean, I'm, I already make fun of KyoAni on a regular basis. So like, oh, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> this is Tuesday for me. <laughs> kind of looking at Trigger's works as a whole. Yeah, like Kill a Kill set them off because I think people were really impressed with the animation and like kind of all of what it had. I wouldn't say it's because it's feminist, but um, having two, a few, actually many women leading this in like an action series is really rare. And like, I know that's what draw me into it for sure. Um, there are other works. I think the more impressive things they've done is definitely Little Witch Academia. And I really like would implore you guys to watch that because it's definitely very different because they have a very different team working on it. And that very much helps how this message comes across and it's like one of those few shows where I'm like hey you can watch this with a kid because it's not gross and it's just pleasant and wonderful <laughs> and some girls doing some cool things just learn about magic and learning about how your heroes will fail you but that's okay um, <laughs> a- Akko seems like a very good protagonist also yeah she's she's delightful so yeah I'd really I'd really like to see it it might be might be something I'd watch right at least soon because it is actually on Netflix here in the UK as well so. Mm. so it would seem that the head writer for Kill a Kill is uh Kazuki Nakashima who also wrote for uh Re Cutie Honey and Gurren Lagann which surprises mm. me zero percent oh really yeah also That's the director was the same director who did Panty and Stocking we're so outside my my <laughs> realm of awareness guys I can't really comment on any of this but I will say that I don't want to I don't want to give cookies for the things that we sure. we praised here. And I think that's... I, I mean, I have a fairly high bar on this stuff anyway. Like, to my mind, having... Fuck, it's the same director of Gurren Lagann, too. Yeah, it's like, this, it. it's like the same team. It's like mostly... Well, not exactly the same, but there's a lot of key players from Gurren Lagann did Kill a Kill. And so a lot okay, of people well, compare Gurren Lagann and Kill a Kill, but like, okay, well, which did you like more? It's like, well, Kill a Kill, but... Yes, I respect and like Kill a Kill <laughs> much more but. than Gurren Lagann. It's actually... It, it it's trying. I'm sorry, Gurren Lagann is clearly made with a lot of love and it's fun to watch, but it's dumb. Okay, let's circle this back to Kill the Kill. So if you talked earlier about a remake Please. Of Kill the Kill. If Fry, you've been put in charge of the remake of Kill the Kill, what do you do with that? Oh god. Um, I think you could do a lot of the sexuality stuff with the Kamui a lot more metaphorically, in a way that still gets across the awkwardness of puberty without, you know, doing the nudity as fan service uh, you could certainly see the you could take out the humiliation aspects or and you know the gross drooling dude hordes that would be lovely um, yes that would be lovely like I, I think definitely embarrassment can be a key can be a part and is a part of adolescence but framing is everything and if you're mm. framing it with the, with the camera as lurid then you are you know profiting off of that humiliation rather than dealing with the fact that this character is uncomfortable. All of the sexual assault, everything needs to be gone and I, oh, Nui needs a rewrite. <laughs> she just, rewrite just gone. Gone. Always. <laughs> New character. Someone else. Written out. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, mm, mm, mm. Yes. But, and, and yeah, I would, <laughs> honestly, I would, on the one hand, Ragyo is so much fun but on the other hand, I really wish this were a a series about these these young women fighting against like a patriarchal force. I wish it was Utana. <laughs> be, be, That's a... just because fashion has has so much ha, has so many roots as being like a tool of rebellion for women. Yeah, but as, dictated by men, and it's like mm-hmm. having them overthrow a man leading that would be a lot more powerful. 
Right, like taking these tools that have been forced on them and actually using them would be so great. Would be so great. And like, yeah, I, I would love a focus on that fashion element as something like, you know, not alongside the ridiculous nudity, you could really expand on that idea of, you know, humans and clothes can are stronger together depending on how you use them and depending on how you gain strength by how you dress yourself as, as like a thing that people design and choose for themselves. I think you could make an enormously powerful statement in a silly power-up anime with that. <laughs> like, there's, there's just that a lot sense. of good fodder here. And, y and you don't need to change anything about you know, Ryuko and Satsuki or uh, Ryuko and Mako's relationship and the student council is still very good and there's a lot of good bones here. I would yeah, love to bring Okada on board because she does ridiculous and over the top but also raw and painful very well. Oh, interesting statement. She, I, I, Okada gets a lot of shit unfairly. When she's on, she is on. Sounds good. Miranda, how about you? What would you do if you would put in charge of the Kill Kill remake? Uh, a lot of what Bri said. Of course, like fewer boob flaps, like just like a lot of unnecessary framing could just go away. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think yep. when if you are focusing on the puberty aspect and like that embarrassment, I think there are yeah tasteful ways to do it without being like, woohoo, look at this thing. Um, Mako's dad needs to not be God. because ah, yes. Mako's family is a Ryuko safe space. Like that's where she goes and feels comfortable and is at home. And like having him being a predator there is disgusting. It's like really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, stop, stop it. You've already By done this last with everybody episodes, else. Yeah. Like they were, they, they were like fine and tolerable and comedic in a small dose that I found acceptable. Yeah, and like they're mm -hmm. caring and like much just better that way. Um, yeah, of course, going back to the sexual assault needs to just not happen. I think there's ways you can do that to make it important to a narrative and like if you're exploring that particularly but it's so hard to do and I don't think they have the capacity to do that that I just say don't do it just stop you can't you're not allowed um, and get rid of Nui <laughs> just like Nui needs, Nui needs to be gone <laughs> I hate her so much <laughs> I don't think I had the response to Nui that either of you did god I, anytime she's I, on screen I, didn't... I just gouge my eyes out <laughs> stop I mean I, I felt that way about Senketsu and Junketsu mm. the Kamui, Kamui forms especially but Nui, I don't know, just felt like a standard cutesy villain to me. I didn't really have that kind of gut knee jerk hatred <laughs> that you both seem to have had of her. Just it, it's it's norm. I don't know what it is about her specifically because like a lot of elements of her archetype, I usually think are fun, and yet here we are, and I hate. Her. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, super cute, powerful woman. Yeah, but oh no, I hate you so much. <laughs> Well, well, and also like I, I love the sad yon, like the sad yandere who is just looking for like, mommy or daddy's approval, and and is clearly like the knockoff because they couldn't get something better, which is usually the hero. Normally, I am down for that kind of character, but Nui is just so obnoxious in the general broader context of Kill a Kill. That that sexual assault though, and the fact that she's a sexual predator type character for a lot longer and more ro overtly than like long before Ryuko and Mako get together. I think that covers remakes because I don't, I don't think I'd do anything differently to you guys. I maybe would say if they're gonna keep the ridiculous fan service costumes, it has to be equal opportunities across the board, mm -hmm. all genders, like put everyone in ridiculous situations, yeah. not just the female characters. But that's that's probably the only thing I'd say. Um. So we, we've looked at all of Kill the Kill. We've seen the whole series. We did <laughs> it. Because it's been such a mythical subject for me for so long. Like, have you seen Kill the Kill? No, I'll get round to it at some point. Or I won't, more likely. And then because of the watch along, I've watched it. And now I've, now I've seen it, I do have a better understanding, I think, of what people what people appreciate about it and I think I can have a more even-handed discussion than I would have been able to in the first six to twelve episodes where I really wasn't having a good time I, I'll be honest I haven't enjoyed this one very much at all but I do have certain things that I'm quite happy to share positivity with people about and that's a better position than I was in before watching the show when all I knew about it was Senketsu basically mm. so I'm pleased that we've done this but like it hasn't it's ended up pretty much where I thought it would I don't think this series has surprised me too much 
Fry, has it been pretty much what you expected? Um, I came out... Like, I, I always expected that when I got to the weird later shit that I'd probably be able to find things I could at least appreciate why people like them. Uh, but I came away mm -hmm. with, with a few, like, some characters I genuinely like and a few things I think... I came... I did not expect to come away, basically, angry that it's not better. Which I think... Oh. Speaks well of the show, because... I had expected that I would be able to kind of academically appreciate what people like about it while generally kind of just going on with my life. But no, there are there are genuinely good things in here, which just makes me angrier about all the Aww. bad shit. <laughs> Taking it personally. Yeah, yeah. No, you came to my house and gave me some really nice things, and then you punched me in the face every few, fi few minutes also. <laughs> And I'm kind of mad about it, Trigger. Why can't you be better? Apply yourself. So maybe I'll watch. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll watch Little Witch Academia and feel better. Yeah, that sounds like a nice thing to do next. I may do that with you, Miranda. This has been your first watch along. Yes, I've greatly enjoyed it. <laughs> how is it? <laughs> how has it been? Like, it, it, has it gone more or less as you expected, or as have we surprised you? Has the discussion surprised you? Um, it I'd say pretty on par. Amelia, you've picked out some things that I didn't pick up on, which I thought was really interesting. Um, kind of like even with this past episode of like the clothes versus people thing, like I thought that was really interesting and like what you're reading from this. Um, I'm sad you didn't like it, but I also kind of didn't expect you to either. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, like I know kind of what shows you do and don't like, and yeah. So um, generally, I wasn't that <laughs> surprised by what we came around with like our discussions and I'm kind of just generally happy that I got a chance to look at this in like such a critical with such a critical lens that I haven't really done before because a lot of times when I watch mm. Kill a Kill it's just for fun and just you know you know kind of turn your brain off for a little bit and just watch that's <laughs> what I like to do sometimes uh, and so getting to look back at this and really dig into what it does right and wrong and how it could be better was very insightful Hey. I, I will say that this has like given me a whole new world of appreciation for Ami Koshimizu, plays uh, Ryuko. Mm -hmm. She is so good in this show. She she is yes. absolutely MVP. I, I just she was having so much fun being brainwashed Ryuko and I was just <laughs> I was just full of delight every time she spoke. There are a few actors actually in this whose voices they were just really distinctive and I wanna go look them up. I didn't want to get too distracted and hear them as other characters, so I haven't done it mm -hmm. yet but I'm looking forward to kind of going through the cast list and seeing who people are. Uh, I was specifically in love okay. with Nanon's character, or voice actor. Yes, she hasn't so done that much and it bums me good. out. Right? Like when I first heard her speak, I was like, excuse me, she's incredible. <laughs> right? So. For, for a, she's got such a, a distinctive second, I kind voice of thought well. she, she might be uh, Nanachi's voice actor because she sounds like them a little bit. From Maiden Abyss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but no, it is not, sadly something fun to do look through the look through the cast list see where everyone else has gone since then like I don't know if there's any big names in there or anything but it seems like I don't know actually was it how was it received in Japan Kill a Kill I don't know how well known it is there I'm not too sure got an OVA so, so I don't know. yeah the OVA <laughs> seems uh the, the the OVA is about um god I can't remember her name uh Ragu's assistant the brown, the right? brown character yes right? the one uh -huh. the singular the one the one brown character yeah I'd like to I'd like to see that I think the... But it's not on it's Netflix. It's okay. Oh, you've seen oh, yeah, it? I have, seen it? I have all the Blu-rays, so I have, mm. I have it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, for, it's Ray. You don't... So yeah, Ray. Mm. Oh, oh, my Ray. Name. Yeah. She's she's the villain in that one. And it's kind of oh, about Satsuki the... and like where they go next. <laughs> yeah. it's That's disappointing. Oh. It's fine. It exists. <laughs> I just don't watch it. I just forget. <laughs> just forget about it. It's fine. <laughs> That's too bad. Okay. Yeah. Kill a kill with OVA money. <laughs> I I, I thought would be really pretty. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, there was like good action there for sure, and like interesting animation, but it's not a good story, story. or it didn't feel very good to me. And I was just like, well, it exists. <laughs> that sucks, and I'm sorry. I mean, story isn't the strong part of Kill a Kill, though, is it really? So, that's, that's, I mean, that's maybe I'm just making that statement myself, but. <laughs> Like, this this is not a show that I look at and think, well, this is all you're capable of. And I just, I will enjoy you as a dumb thing that's doing what you're doing. I do have shows I enjoy like that, but this show is capable mm -hmm. of being smarter, and I want to shake it and make it apply itself. Oh, Nanon's voice actor was Haruko in FLCL. Oh, yeah, 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 that tracks. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, yes. Ah, oh, that does make sense. 
Okay, we're just getting anyway. distracted talking yeah. by other shows. <laughs> so neat, neat minutia. I think we should we should wrap this up so we can all just go and read through the cast lists, and yeah. read through the staffing lists, well, and figure this one out. It's so bizarre to me. Like, I wonder if it did maybe not make us so much of a splash in Japan. I don't know, but it seems like Trigger became a big deal, but but people didn't take the cool things from Kill la Kill to copy. Like, I, I can't think of any other anime that has the kind of... that that took Ryuko and Mako, or um, Ryuko and Satsuki's relationship, even, and, and rolled with that mm-hmm. from this. Like, the, copy that! Copy that! Not the fan service <laughs> gonzo nonsense! Yeah, that would be really nice to see. Like, I'd love to see more action shows, actually, with these kinds of relationships. For sure. Like the, the Yuko Satsuki, Mako, Elite Four. Like there's so much among those characters and among those relationships that I really enjoyed, genuinely. Yeah, it, it feels like Kill a Kill had a lot of just visual. Consistently and a- undermined. Yeah, it, it had a lot of visual and aesthetic influence more than the right. good parts of its narrative. It's sad. That makes sense. That's sad. It is sad. I think that wraps it up. Yeah. Oh. Although I feel bad ending this podcast on such a sad note. Something nice about Kill a Kill? Should we? It- who would we recommend this to? Who would we recommend of our readers or listeners? People to, with a to high watch bullshit content, uh, like a, a high bullshit tolerance. Because, uh, c- like, again, there are. Satsuki is a really good character. She I can see why people, excellent. like, really love her. I have a statue of her that I got when I was in Japan of her wearing Senketsu, just because she just looks really cool. I got it. Yes. I love it. Good. Very excellent. Much. Like, like her, her design is good. Her. Char- yeah. like her character is good the acting is good her arc is like probably the most solid writing of the show Satsuki is really good and and Ryuko Mako is very good so like if you're into Yuri and have a high bullshit tolerance like you will be rewarded at the end <laughs> how about have we got any if you like this show then you'll also like Kill the Kill any recommendations like that let's see what <laughs> what Oh, it's kind of giggling over shows here. Do you I like, like... Gurren Lagann? <laughs> yep, you've probably already watched Kill the Kill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that is definitely a more positive note. I think if anyone, if anyone's listening to this and you have seen Kill the Kill and you think, oh well, obviously everyone who's fans of this show over here would love Kill the Kill, please do say so. We will retweet it. So just let us know. Um, but I think that just wrapped it up. We've we've said so much, I think, that we could probably talk about it for a very long time, but I think we'd end up circling around ourselves because we all feel very strongly about the same kinds of things. So thank you so much for joining me for this. A um, little bit of housekeeping. You can find our work at www.animefeminist.com. You can find us on Twitter at Anime Feminist. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash animefem. Uh, you can find us on Tumblr, animefeminist.tumblr.com. And we have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash animefeminist. So we pay everyone who contributes to Anime Feminist, writers, editors, administrators, audio editors for this podcast. Um, but we're not yet breaking even. We still have a few hundred dollars to go to that. So if you can send us a dollar a month to continue our work, it does add up. Honestly, it really, really does. And if you give us $5 a month, you'll get access to the special Anime Feminist Discord server, where you can have discussions like this one in a safe, feminist-friendly environment, which is really useful when talking about shows like Kill the Kill. So if you can stretch to it, please, patreon.com slash anime feminist, send us a dollar a month to continue our work. Thank you so much to Brian Miranda, and we'll have another watch long soon, so please stay tuned for that.